And it, uh, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I love that first verse. Yeah. And, and then it goes on to say, our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. The tribes of the, uh, when the, where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord to the testimony of Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. For thrones are set up for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love thee. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will say, peace be within you. And you know, God blesses those that bless Israel. Amen. Right. And God wants us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Those are God's chosen people. They're, that's where God started everything was in that's where he started his plan and purposes and the prophets of old came out of israel and they prophesied even the church age yeah america needs to bless israel that's right we need to bless israel we need to here in verse six pray for the peace of jerusalem may they prosper who love you Amen. god are gonna god is gonna bless those that bless israel that's right praise god to Second Corinthians chapter 12 we're going to go over verses 1 through 10 but before we read the verses of scriptures I just want to uh, say that today we will consider a strange paradox in God's word you know you might say well, what's a paradox a paradox may be defined as an assertion seemingly contradictory or opposed to common sense and uh you know, Jesus used paradoxes in many of his teachings. You know, to give you just a few examples, he said, the first will be last. You know, how is that? You know, that boggles the common sense, amen? He said, the servant will be made ruler. He who dies to self will live, and others. He had other paradoxes. The paradox that we will focus on today is God's strength made perfect in weakness. How many's ever heard of being strong when you're weak? You can be with God's strength. Amen. 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 You can be with God's strength. Uh, our text finds a great man of God in deep trouble. Hardship and disappointment all but overwhelmed him. For a while, even his prayers seemed to bring him only frustration. Has anybody ever been there? Has anybody ever been there? You felt like your prayers only brought you more frustration. That nothing seemed to be being answered. God will answer your prayers. Amen. Amen. But through prayer and self-surrender, he came to the place where he was glad to suffer. If that meant that the power of Christ would rest on him in a unique way. In this, in this particular passage, Paul has been answering his critics and actually it starts in second corinthians uh, 11 paul and the false prophets the false prophets were saying well you know paul you're not really spiritual you're not really this you're not really that we're super apostles you know we're super apostles we're in other words they were just full of spiritual pride you know they they probably had followers and, you know, they pat people on the back of the neck and told them how spiritual they were and, and, and this and that. But anyway, Paul s starts boasting about his sufferings, but he's doing it God's way. Amen. He says, I must go on boasting. You know, he's carrying this on from the 11th chapter. He says, although there is nothing to be gained... What's to be gained in your boasting? Yet, spiritual people boast. But there's nothing to be gained. They, they have their reward right there. You know, the Bible says, let not your right hand know what your left hand is doing, or vice versa. <laughs> you know, God doesn't want us to be boasting, amen? 
And then he, Paul goes on to say, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, who's this man in Christ? He's talking about himself. He didn't want to be, you know, puffed up boasting about himself. So he's saying, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Well, what's the third heaven? Well, the first heaven is the atmosphere. The second heaven is the universe. The third heaven is God's dwelling place. Paul says he was caught up to the third heaven. Man, he'd been there. He'd seen heaven. It says, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And some commentators think that this is when Paul was stoned and left for dead. I believe he was really dead but yet God brought him back to life. So I believe he was out of the body when he was up in the third heaven. In verse 3 it says, And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelation, there was given me a thorn in my flesh. Has anybody here ever had a thorn in your flesh? It doesn't feel good a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My power is made perfect in weakness. You know, God uses amazing things to show his strength and weakness. Amen. Amen. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, uh, there were times that Paul was sick. And... Uh, you know, uh, because of his hesitancy, hesitancy to speak about himself, the false teachers and critics of Paul were saying that he lacked in spiritual experiences. Paul was probably the most spiritual man that ever lived except for Jesus. You know, he was a great man of God. And I, I, I look for, I, I mean, I want to meet Jesus, of course. But my next one I want to meet, other than my family, is uh, the Apostle Paul because he suffered much for the kingdom of God. You know, and that his salvation and ministry were suspect because he had not had the kind of experiences they were privileged to have. They thought to themselves and questioned others, how could Paul be called of God if he has not had spiritual visions and revelations from the Lord? We have had them if he has really been called of God. See, these guys were going around talking about if they had any kind of revelation or, or spiritual insight that they thought of, I'm sure it was demonic. They hadn't really had any godly revelations like the Apostle Paul had. You know, they were asking, why has he not had them? Well, he's telling them, hey, I've had them. I've even been up to the third heaven. I've been there. I've seen paradise. I've seen heaven. You know, Paul had to defend himself against his critics. These critics were being called super apostles. You know, of course, we're talking about the apostle Paul. He was a humble man of God. And, and he had to save the Corinthians church from these false teachers. They were trying to move in and take over. Uh, I don't know where you're going to church, but I guarantee there's going to be people, going to be people that's going to move in and try to take over. Any church. How many knows that the devil is one of the most faithful church attenders in the world? He can put a lot of Christians to shame as far as his faithful attendance. 
He wants to disrupt and destroy churches, amen? And he plants these false teachers in churches trying to steal people away. People that aren't getting into the Word of God, they're not getting rooted and grounded in the Word of God. That's why we need to know the Word of God, amen? Because the Spirit and the Word agree. You know, it scares me when someone says, well, the Holy Spirit told me this, and the Holy Spirit told me that, and the Holy Spirit said this, and the Holy Spirit said that. You know, it, it, it kind of rings an alarm. I'm not saying the Holy Spirit doesn't speak to the heart of man because he does, amen. But you have to remember that the Spirit and the Word agree. That's right. The Lord's going to speak mostly to you through the Word of God, amen. Through the Word of God. You know, he had to save the Corinthian church from the false teachers, and he was left with no choice. This is the reason he shares this spiritual experience. Paul wasn't trying to boast on himself. You know, he was trying to tell these super apostles, hey, I've had revelations. I've had spiritual insight. Uh, however, in sharing this experience, he does not share anything about it. He wants no attention upon himself, but rather all attention upon Christ Jesus our Lord. The minister's boasting is unprofitable. Anybody that boasts about themselves, it's unprofitable. But he must defend himself as stated. You know, Paul had no choice. He had to defend himself against these false accusations. These false teachers were trying to turn people off to Paul, trying to turn them away from him. You know, after he had labored and struggled to get churches going and, and get you know, ministry rooted and grounded in these churches and trying to give him a bad name and a black eye and and all these things. I, You know, I think that if you're a real man or woman of God, there may come a time when someone's trying to give us a black name or a black eye or turn people away from us. Well, we just do what Paul did. He prayed constantly, amen. He, he said in the word that he prayed in tongues more than us more than them all. You know, we just pray in the spirit or pray in English as as you under, you know what to pray. Amen. If you don't know what to pray, pray in the spirit. Amen. Ah, uh, that's why Paul was sharing these visions and revelations. Amen. Ah. Uh, Paul moved in boasting or in sharing any of his spiritual experiences, there is a much needed lesson. We must always lift up Jesus and not ourselves. The gospel of Christ alone can reach and grow people, not our personal spiritual experiences. Uh, Paul knew this and we must learn from it. Paul continued his boastings by telling about the revelations and such. Uh, amen. But like I said, Paul had been to the third heaven. Uh, praise the Lord. You know, Paul had been uniquely touched by God. And to speak of his thorn in the flesh, we do not know what Paul's thorn in the flesh was because it doesn't plainly tell us. Uh, some have su suggested that it was malaria, epilepsy, or a disease of the eyes. In Galatians four thirteen through 15, it says, As you know... It was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. Even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. What has happened to all your joy, I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. You know, we don't know what the thorn in the flesh was. But three times he pleaded with God, and God said, My grace is sufficient for you. Maybe you've been pleading with God about a certain something or other. God is saying, God is replying to you. He's speaking to you today, telling you that my grace is sufficient for you. Amen? Amen. Paul said, You know, I'd been abound and I'd been abased. In other words, he'd had plenty and he'd had lack. But nevertheless, you know, God's grace was sufficient, amen? amen? He learned to be content in whatever state he found himself to be in. You know, I was listening to a preacher this morning before our service, 
and I was getting excited about the rapture. Um, he just made me feel like the rapture is going to be, you know, soon. Uh, four to five years or even sooner, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. No man knows the day or the hour. We know the season. But we know the season. And we know that we need to live every day as if he's coming today. Amen. Amen. You know, if everybody knew the day or the hour, they'd probably just lay back in a pair of sunglasses on a beach somewhere and just wait until that time to come and then get, oh, hallelujah, holy, holy. You know, that's why we need to live every day like we're, Jesus is coming. Amen. Amen. But whatever the case, it was a chronic, debilitating problem which at times kept him from working. How many has ever been judged for being sick by Christians? <laughs> you know, well, you sinner. There must be sin in your life. You're <laughs> sick. Look at the Apostle Paul. He suffered illness. He, he was one of the most saintly men of God I, I've ever read about. But he got sick. Just because we're born again and spirit-filled doesn't mean that we're exempt from ever becoming sick. I pray we never become sick. But if we do, we have prayer and we have doctors to help. Amen? I remember one time when I was in my 20s, I had a toothache and I went and got prayer for it. And, you know, and it subsided even after they prayed. And then one of the men that prayed for me said, now go to the dentist. <laughs> yeah. We was using godly wisdom. Amen. Amen. You know, thorns will come, but so will relief. God answered Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. You know, in your weakness, I'm going to show you my strength. Amen. Amen. Uh, this thorn was a hindrance to his ministry because at times it kept him from working. But God refused. Paul was a very self-sufficient person, so this thorn must have been difficult for him. Three times he prayed and didn't receive it. <coughs> he received, however, things far greater because he received greater grace from God, a stronger character, humility, and an ability to empathize with others empathize with others that just means you know how they feel yeah. <clears throat> you know how to minister to them amen in addition it benefited those around him as they saw God at work in his life God according to his sovereign plan Paul is the living proof that holy living and courageous faith do not ensure instant physical healing but we do believe in healing, That's right. just as Paul believed in healing. If you pray for healing and it doesn't happen all at once, just keep praying, amen? amen? You know, I always pray, Lord, I thank you. I ask in Jesus' name to speed up the healing process in my body. You know, God believes in healing. He even put a healing, you know, your body heals itself, amen? amen. And... Sometimes, you, you know, with incurable diseases, you know, I've heard of people being healed of cancer and, and limbs growing back. And, you know, I don't understand a sovereign God. His thoughts are above my thoughts and his ways are above my ways. You know, I don't know the answer. I don't have the answer. But God moves in mysterious ways. Amen. I don't know why some are healed and some are not. I don't know you know, why Paul had to deal with this thorn in his flesh. It says, it says, you know, so he wouldn't become puffed up because of all the revelation he'd seen. But, you know, I believe in healing. Amen. Amen. I believe in healing. You know, w when we pray for healing, we must trust our bodies to God's care. Uh, you know, we must uh, recognize that nothing separates us from the love of Christ. And that our spiritual condition is always more important than our physical condition. Our spiritual condition. Amen. Although God did not remove Paul's affliction, he promised to demonstrate his power in Paul, which God did. Uh, the fact that God's power displayed in our weaknesses should give us courage and hope. You know, you got to remember you're human. Amen. Amen. You got to look at it like this. 
God the Father come up with the plan of redemption. God the Son went to the cross, executed the plan of redemption. God the Holy Spirit reveals that plan to the heart of man. It was God the Father's plan to send Jesus in the form of a man. God could have sent Jesus in his superior strength, his almighty strength to destroy the works of the devil when he came to earth. But God didn't choose to do it that way. God could have sent Jesus as strong as the devil, you know, above a human, to destroy the works of the devil. But God didn't choose to do it that way. God chose to send Jesus in the lowly form of a man, in the lowly form of a human, just like you and me, full of God's spirit to utterly destroy the works of the devil. Amen. God will show his strength even though we are weak. Amen. 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 Woo! Makes me want to talk in tongues. Glory. Our limitations not only help develop Christian character, but also deepen our worship. Because in admitting them, we affirm, we affirm God's strength. You know, Josh was talking earlier about worship. That worship is more than just singing songs and hymns. That we can worship God with our giving. We can worship God with the way we live our life. Amen? You know, we can worship God in many ways, in many forms. When we are strong in abilities or resources, we are tempted to do God's work on our own. How many has ever tried to do that? I know I've tried to get ahead of God. You know, you get some money in your pocket and say, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Well, you might ought to wait on God, amen? What someone can do with a hundred million dollars, God could probably do with a thousand. <laughs> So don't get ahead of God, amen? amen? When we are weak, allowing God to fill us with his power, then we are stronger than we could be on our own. God does not intend, us for, intend for us to be weak, passive, or ineffective. You know, uh, but when those obstacle comes, obstacles come, we must depend on God, amen? amen? Only his power make us effective for him. You know, in our pain, sorrow, agony, heartache, disappointment, poverty, trouble, and incapabilities, we must come to pray. Your will be done. Occasionally in life, when we meet a person who has an incurable disease or twisted body, causing profound suffering, yet paradoxically seen within that person, is a consistently radiant and selfless life. Through faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to close right there. <coughs> I'd like to ask my wife to come. She's going to offer to you a salvation prayer. She's probably going to give you a few announcements. And I hope... That you get saved today, amen. Amen. Woo. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You know, uh, we we both believe, and Pastor Steve was saying, we believe that God heals us. And the Word of God says, by the stripes that Jesus bore, we are healed. But then, you know, sometimes we still go through trials, though. And st sometimes we still go through afflictions. And Jesus said, in this world, you'll have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. You know, if, if we prayed and we got healed immediately every time we prayed and we saw the manifestation, we wouldn't have any need for faith. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And just because you see a great man or woman of God going through a trial of affliction, uh, whether it be a heart attack or, or a cancer or, 
or something else. Don't judge them and, and think there's sin in their life or there's something lacking and then they're all not spiritual. Don't think like that. And don't get all puffed up because you haven't gone through that particular trial yet in your life and think you're above them. You know, we've seen this over the years. We've seen uh, years ago we had a, a, a pastor that had a heart attack. Well, all the young and mature unbelievers were going to him and preaching to him the word like he didn't already know it. And he was the one that taught them, you know, and, and you know, they were judging him. Well, while he was going through his healing process, well, this man was so full of God's grace and God's love and God's strength that he just, you know, forgave him and just went on and it didn't really bother him any. And he got better and came back and started, God started using him like he always had, you know, but, um, and, you know, uh, yeah, so don't judge someone uh, just because you see them going through a trial or affliction. And, you know, I think Paul, that was one of the reasons why he was having to defend himself to these people because they were trying to point out, look, you know, look, he's weak, you know. But he showed, God spoke to him and said, in, in your weakness, you'll be strong. And Paul went through a lot for the gospel. He suffered many things. But you know what? He was one of the strongest men we knew because of God's strength. He kept on preaching. He never gave up. People would whip him. People would beat him. They'd stone him. They'd leave him from dead. They'd put it, throw him in prison. He'd go through shipwrecks. You know what? He'd get back up and go preach in the next town. He'd get back up and go preach in the next country. And nothing stopped him because he knew in whom he believed and he was persuaded that, you know, he was going to overcome because of the power of God and he was going to obey God and fulfill the plans and purposes of his life. Now, if you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart and you feel a tug on your heart today that you're, you need to surrender your life to this God of love that we serve, you know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, your life doesn't end when you die. You can have eternal life with Jesus when you die. You don't have to go to hell. You don't have to suffer for your sins because Jesus paid the penalty on the cross for your sins. He paid that price and then he rose again from the dead so that you can live a life of victory. He will empower you. He will strengthen you. He loves you so much that he died for you. There's no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends and even more of a love that a man lays down his life for his enemies, those that have even not served him and even hated him maybe. But today, regardless of what you've done in your life, you can have a new beginning. And I'd like to invite you to pray this prayer with us. Father in heaven, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for my sins. Jesus, I believe that God raised you from the dead. So I can live a life of victory. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. And be Lord over my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer in faith, believing you are now a child of God, old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You have a new lease on life. All that old sin, it's gone. The Bible says it's buried in the depths of the sea, yep. and the sea's pretty deep. And you don't have to worry about that. You, It's all gone. You can start out fresh and new now. Get your Holy Bible out. If you don't have one, get you one. Get a Holy Bible. Start reading it. This is God's good news for you.